I just wanted an easy summer job, and my friend wanted to buy a million paper clips. Only one of us got what we wanted that summer. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, Eric Vitello, Jeff Atwood, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Under even the most nostalgic of lenses, me, at 21, was a complete rambunctious mess. No good at conducting myself. I had a whole bunch of things to learn about socializing, interacting with others in a professional way, and dressing for the part. Yet, due to the weirdness of being a temp, I found myself being assigned one of the more important positions in the IBM structure. IBM, a huge company over a hundred years old, had decided in its own way to become nimble, to become like a startup, as best that it could possibly do. To do this, they had created a tiger team, a team of their best and brightest salespeople from around the country, and, reflecting the time that this all happened, they came up with a very analog solution to what they were trying to do. Having as much office space lying fallow as entire companies would use for their work, IBM had created an area on a floor to which these six salespeople would assemble every three or four weeks and have meetings about different accounts that would need the IBM Touch but also be able to respond much quicker than IBM was at the time. The idea was this. Take people from each of the regions, the southern region, the western region, the northern region, and so on, and put them into one physical location, enabling them to quickly work together in person for a few days each month, and then be able to give these results to the client and have a full countrywide answer that they could rely on. To make this happen, they needed support staff. They needed somebody who would be the receptionist, caretaker, and accessible person on the phone so they could prepare for these regular meetings. And as luck would have it, they ended up hiring me. Now, I was nothing special. There was nothing about me to recommend that I work at this job. I was just the next name that came up in the random lottery of temping. I was available, I was willing to travel to where this was going on, and I had the basic skills, words per minute typing, computer proficiency, and ability to answer the phone that was in whatever the requisition was. This was, looking back, quite a mistake. They should have had one of their more senior secretaries, or admins working on this project, somebody who had been there for years, who knew the IBM way forwards and backwards, and would be able to work within the system so that these six people were locked in whenever they met. But I think it was the combination of only meeting once every three weeks that made it seem that it wasn't a real job, a real full-time job. In practice, when I got there, I found that they were constantly contacting me, making sure that things would be ready for them during their visits. It was, in fact, pretty much a real full-time job, and one that people should have been assigned to from the secretarial pool. But here I was, young, relatively inexperienced, truly a mess, as their greeting caretaker for whenever they would come to this location. This floor was weird. Think of a square with offices on the inside of the square and the outside of the square, and the hallways extending from corner to corner of a massive building. As off-putting as that may seem, it was even more so because most of the offices were completely empty, devoid of furniture even. Some of them, at best, would have a desk with a phone and an empty shelf waiting for an employee that would never arrive. 
Clearly, IBM had bought the lease on this building, expecting an expansion of employees that was never to come again. So I would spend a lot of time alone in my corner of this building, waiting all day for a phone call, for a message, and doing a little bit of work every once in a while, staring down two massive empty hallways with some sort of human motion at the end, either a secretary walking from one door to another, or maybe just a little shifting of light as clouds went over this ridiculous building. Meanwhile, my friend, who I will not reveal, they have a family after all, had also been assigned to a job temping for IBM. In their job, they were working in purchasing and requisitions. Orders would come in from different offices around the different regions. They'd put it together into a requisition form, translating the request into these triplicate IDs and then ordering them to be sent to the office location. It helps to know that IBM, by the 1990s, was so well regulated that you could use their internal addressing system to send a specific package from one person to another using only an office ID and having it leave your desk, go through a worldwide shipping system, and appear on that other desk as if it was just a normal flow of objects. Meanwhile, behind it was this massive infrastructure, keeping track of thousands of packages a day, moving from vendors and offices to other vendors and other offices. In this realm, my friend worked as a temp, moving between different orders, filling out with a pen, a carbon copy order requisition form, and then moving it through the system. They were very, very smart. They had way too much knowledge and ability and power to be able to sit still looking at this system. The natural thoughts came to them over the weeks. How was this requisition system verified? How did they know who had ordered what? What methods did they use for auditing? How would it be tracked back? What could you order and how much of it. And somewhere in the realm of all this, they started to focus on the concept, the idea, of a million paperclips. Meanwhile, at my location, weeks in, I was having the time of my life, if the time of your life meant living inside of a dark, unhappy hallway, waiting for something to happen, and typing randomly on the electric typewriter they had gifted you with. That was one of the longest times I've ever interacted with an honest-to-God IBM Selectric typewriter writing out lyrics for my band, poetry, and story ideas, giving the impression of somebody who was very busy, but actually just being creative within a huge white hallway of nothingness. The requests of the super salesmen were frankly, easy. They were good people, really personable, able to interact with you, which had made them incredible salespeople and also made them a dream to work for. And that should have been fine. But I was young, and I was also prone to not sleeping very well. So being on site for 8.30 a.m. every day, waiting for the experience of working for nobody all day, and then heading home, began to wear me down. This is the problem with abundance. On paper, it seems wonderful. Having no direct reports, being able to go through a day, choose the things you want to work on. But unless you're a certain kind of temperament, your mind starts to wander. You have trouble focusing. And over time, especially if you use your evenings to escape, it all begins to become very, very tiring. So I'll tell you that more than once I would come in at 8.30, put down a note saying I was out getting something, go over to one of those empty offices, have the calls forwarded to it, and fall asleep in that office. I have no idea how much I was snoring or if I was making noise, but I think at that point some of the secretaries 
started to figure out what I was doing. And they had plans. Speaking of plans, my friend figured out who could get those million paper clips. A mutual acquaintance of ours had not just graduated, but actually gotten a job at IBM, had a real office with a real address in this worldwide requisition system, could be sent things. And so my friend formulated a plan. As it was explained to me, the requisition documents represented a whole manner of trust. The assumption was that whoever was filling out the requisition form knew what they were doing, would willingly identify themselves, and would always send it to an IBM address. Naturally, coming up with a requisition for, let's say, 10 typewriters and sending them to an outside address to be taken resold or otherwise used for something other than IBM business would be theft, might even be a felony, stealing from work. But sending the wrong items to the wrong location was merely incompetence, something that could be tracked down later and handled. Using this perceived loophole, my friend began putting together the order. Paper clips come in boxes of 1,000. And therefore, one million paper clips is 1,000 1,000 count boxes. Filling out the form using gloves was easy. Reverse engineering how IBM kept track of different purchasing agents and different purchasing departments was a snap. So a phantom purchasing agent from a phantom purchasing department made the order. The order was filled in, sent in, just as my friend was leaving their summer term at IBM. So the plan was executed, and there was only one fatal flaw. Speaking of fatal flaws, my problem was that the job I had was desirable. And one of the secretaries on the floor I was on, I found out later, was in danger of having the executive they were working for retiring. Where they would be assigned what they would do next was up in the air. This was a time when you were bonded to whoever you were working for. It was a lifetime appointment, and if that person was retired, there was a chance you might be retired as well. So the secretary, after gaining from the office gossip about this young person who would fall asleep in spare offices, utilized a series of complaints, comments, and ultimately an offer to replace me. Being a temp and being fired is not the same as many other companies. I didn't have any personal items at the desk. Nobody was going to make me fill a box up with my personal items and walk out saying goodbye. I simply got a phone call at the end of the day after I'd gotten home, and the agency told me my services were no longer required. As I recall, some of the complaints about my behavior had filtered up to the temp agency, but I assured them this was just gossip and not true, but that I understood that for the good of the company, it was good to just call things done and have me move on to my next assignments, which I did. Temps are, after all, are always needed somewhere for various jobs that others simply would not do. And frankly, this was invaluable to me. At the age of 21, I'd learned about office intrigue, about the ways that people could smile at you in the middle of the day and stab you later when you weren't around. The fact that you could have your job, your career, affected by both your behavior, but more importantly, by people who would turn a minor mistake, a poor choice, into a career-ending decision. I took that knowledge with me when I left the temp world, and I was able, on multiple occasions, to fent, parry, and push back attempts to get rid of me or cause me harm within the office world by people who were not looking out for my best interest. That's a lesson I'll always be able to live with, and a mistake worth making at least once. Like the minor mistake my friend made in ordering 
those one million paperclips. Think about it for a moment. Those paperclips would come in 10 100-count boxes in a larger box, and that box would be combined with 30 or more other boxes in a larger box. But taking that into account, think about what 1,000 1,000 count boxes represents in real space. A million paper clips is a word, but what started to show up at our mutual friend's office was a truckload of paper clips, one after another after another, boxes of boxes of boxes being taken down the hallway and put in front of their office, filling up the hallway lining up until it filled up the area. Realizing something was terribly wrong, these boxes started to pile up in the loading area. Plastic sealed inside of pallets coming off of trucks. I'm happy to say nobody went to jail. Nobody got reprimanded. Questions were asked about this bizarre order that clearly represented somebody typing in the wrong address, the wrong number, and causing this wild mistake to fill a hallway and a loading dock with paper clips. But mistakes can be forgiven. The mutual friend didn't find out for a very long time who was behind it, and nobody knew that it was on purpose until right now. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bighoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Peter Healy, Emilio Oliveira, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Matt Reynolds, Sean Kelly, Manxalot, John Sturm, and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Seriously, get out a piece of paper get out a notepad, and figure out how big 1,000 boxes of 1,000 paper clips is in real life. And you will never, ever just assume that a collection of anything is a certain size again.